we start off our service today, is there a scripture, uh, something that spoke to you this week, something that you'd want to share, something on your mind? All right. I'm trying to be joyful, okay, because the song was joy, joy, you know what I mean? But I'm going to tell you, that extra hour just threw me for a loop today. I don't know what it is. This is weird. It's like I time traveled back in time and I just got to trip over my own feet today. I don't know what it is. We were having some flub ups in the, in the uh, worship rehearsal. We were just, you know, just. But God loves our mess. He does. Because He redeems it for His good. There's a, there was a movie I watched a while ago. It's called Joshua. It's a, it's a bit more of a Catholic movie, but there's an illustration in that movie. This woman comes up. She has this, you know, he has this beautiful face, and she, she's, she's, she's talking to this guy, and she's like, I don't know what to do. I'm just a mess. I'm just whatever. And she moves her hand, and she knocks this glass vase all over into the, into the, into the hay, and he's in a barn, and just breaks this glass everywhere, shatters. And she says, my life's a mess. Nothing, nothing you can do with that. And at the end of the movie, this man pieced together every little piece of glass back into a new shape, into a beautiful angel or a beautiful bird, and gave it to her. And said, you know what? You take that broken mess, and God makes you new. God redeems you for His good and His glory. It's a beautiful illustration that we can come to Him whether we're joyful, whether we're hurting, whether we're struggling, and He will help that mess as we trust in Him, as we follow Him. Amen. And so I want you to be able to share that message with others. And next week is our Bring a Friend to Church Sunday. Amen. So take these off the table. I want to more of these on that. I want to get them all out of here and in people's hands in our community so that they can come to our church service. And if you've got to link arms with somebody and bring them here, help them get to our church because we're going to have a wonderful Thanksgiving dinner. Sherry's work, been working tirelessly and trying to get sign-ups for people to be able to bring in things. If you can bring extra meat, if you can bring a dish of, dish of green beans, if you can bring a dessert, sign up out there on the table. Because the little that you can give will translate into that big meal, just like that feast that we're going to have someday with God. We bring our little bit to be able to be at the table and be at that feast. And let's have that be that message next week as we have new faces in our congregation, as we have old faces coming back, people have been telling, hey, you know, I'm going to be there on that Sunday, you know, let's, let's do that, it's next week. And so make sure this week you're connecting with somebody, that you're helping remind them, reshare that faith for our event, if you're able, if you're someone that's a Facebook kind of person, and let's get this place packed and hopping next week. What do you think about that? Would that be a good thing? Amen. Oh, I'd love it. Uh, that is all us and God working together for His glory. So, let me pray. Any other announcements or things I'm forgetting? We got the women's breakfast here on, on Saturday, right? Yeah. 9 a.m. Good, good yeah. gathers, right? We got that going. And then we have a, a person running around with a camera trying to catch you, just so you know. Yeah. For, our, for our photo wall out there. Yeah. They're not tracking it down. They're not an evil spy, okay? They're not going to malicious. And we're trying to just get the family of God here at the church represented our. Uh, photo wall out there, so if there's someone with a camera that comes up and says, hey, can I have your picture for the directory? Or hey, is your information in the directory accurate? You could go track them down, baby. Her name's Jeanette Prescott. She's right here. So you got to track her down. So you got to get this. So let me make it easy for her. Come to her. Help her get that picture so we can get that new directory for this year out and start our photo wall updated for our church as well. Okay? Oh, that's what's going to happen. Yes, Terry? It's not paparazzi, right? It's not the paparazzi, no. She's not going to come to your house and be like, okay, let's get in. You know, she's not going to do that. Just come, get a picture taken, or uh, give her a picture of some kind in a digital format to be printed out, or, or whatever kind of format, and then we can kind of get that there so that we can um, enjoy the family of God here at our church, represented here in our fellowship hall and in our place. All right, any other announcements? I'm not forgetting. To God be the glory. That's the most important. All right, let's pray. Let's pray. Lord God, we come to you humble and honest and open today that you can do great things through us and with us. That you are a source of strength, you are a source of hope, and we ask you to fill us with your spirit today so that we can rely on your strength, so that we can have your hope, that we can see things through your eyes that we wouldn't normally see. 
know, the world sometimes gives us mixed messages and tells us various things in different ways, God. We want, we want your truth. We want your message. We want your love. And we want your peace that passes all understanding. God, help us to worship you here today in spirit and in truth. Help us to be in your presence every day and take steps of faith with you and for you. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Please stand as we continue worshiping our Lord.
ropas que hayas vidas into your, with your glory leading us, with your will, with your sovereign love leading us, God, we can do nothing without it, God. We can, it's just nothing we can present. Lord, when we rely on our own strength, we're doomed to failure, Lord, but when we rely on your strength, anything can happen. It can happen within us, within our families, within the people in our lives, God. Help us to seek you first. Seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness. God, we ask you to bless the service today. Help us today, wherever we're at. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Praise God. You can be seated this morning. We've got a couple of uh, ushers help us out with this morning's offering. So who do we got? we got Kenzie and Daniel. That's what we got. Come on up. This morning's offering. Please feel led to give as you. As you uh, please feel free to give as you feel led to, to give today. Let's pray. Lord God, we ask you to bless uh, this offering that we receive today. That it will be glorifying to you. That it will grow your kingdom here in our church, God. And help us. Um, help us. We ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen.
Well, it is the first Sunday of the month, and so um, we, every first Sunday, will serve communion here uh, to honor God, to honor Jesus for his sacrifice for us, that he died on the cross. And so if I could have a couple ushers help me this morning come up um, to help me serve communion. Who do we have helping out today? I guess I will. Who's willing to yeah. give a helping hand? Yeah. Gloria and Karen. Thank you so much, Gloria and Karen. I'm going to read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 here. Verse 23. Sorry, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I have also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so as we remember Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us, you know, the, the thing about that, that event that strikes me is that the devil thought he won. Mm -hmm. But it was actually Jesus' ultimate victory. And so as we think about sometimes, again, I'm going to go to this uh, message again, our flub-ups and our mistakes, that Jesus has the ultimate victory. That he continues to provide that for us. Even whatever we have to give, however big or small, meek or strong, he redeems it for his God. We serve open communion at our church, which means that you don't have to be Wesleyan to be able to receive communion. All you have to have, to have done is have accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And so you are welcome to, to partake with communion today. The bread is matzah and the juice is grape juice. And we also take our communion a little differently from other churches. As you take the bread, you are welcome to take it and eat it to symbolize how we individually come to Christ. But we would ask you to hold the juice to the end to symbolize our unity and take that all together as we symbolize our unity in Jesus Christ. Take the meat. <laughs>
Jesus took the cup and said, Drink in remembrance of me. And Lord God, we do remember you. That you died, that you truly died for us. That your sacrifice on the cross was sad, though unexpected, helped, provided that way for ultimate victory for us over sin and death, helping us see your, your life, helping us see eternity, helping see a man come back. Lord, thank you for your son Jesus Christ who made that sacrifice for us, for each one of us here for that free gift of salvation which is given to those who accept and believe and receive your Holy Spirit. I pray that we're able to share that message to as many people as possible in this community. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we got some kids around. I don't know if you noticed that this morning. They were uh, having lots of fun out there. But we're going to dismiss them down to our children's church program. So if you are ages 3 to 11, please get to the back of the sanctuary there. Find out who your teacher is today. Make sure your parents have a pager and your grandparents have a pager in case you need assistance. And get down in there and learn some stuff about God. Huh? <laughs> Old friends, that's nice. Uh, it was really nice to have Elise here yesterday as well because she had her, her birthday party. Uh, I've never seen as many Paw Patrol things in my life. Great. Uh, that's my praise today. Uh, any praises or prayers on your heart today that you want to share or that you need prayer over? Um, things going on in your life. What's what's going on? Faith. Yes, Louise Clark is very sick. Um, she's waiting for some results on a test, but she's in constant AFib. So if you could keep her in your prayer, please. Is she in the hospital as well? No, they've got her on all kinds of meds, and they've done, um, she, she's bound to determine she's not going into a hospital. Okay. But um, she's, she's on every kind of medicine there is to keep her off this AFib, and they can't keep her out of it. So. All right. We will pray for Louise Pluff and her AFib, and uh, that the doctors, that God would heal her, but that the doctors will be able to figure out what's going on there too, and help her through those times. Other prayers, praises. Jeanette? I have one. Um, the women's retreat was supposed to be earlier, and they had they postponed it till yesterday. So I'm thanking God for the water break that they had, because if they would have had it the original date, I wouldn't have been able to go because I was sick. So thank you, Lord, for that water main break, and that I can go. <laughs> Amen. Uh, God uses all sorts of things. Uh, I don't know, you guess because that women's retreat was uh, supposed to be in October, and there was a water main breakup in um, Watertown, so it got postponed until yesterday, and I know several women went there and were blessed by, the, by Kim, uh, the leader, uh, pastor's wife of the Watertown Wesleyan up there, so Grace Wesleyan, I think her name is. So. Ah, praise God. Terry. Uh, yeah, because what happened?
happens is sometimes those little things that we're trying to give up, we like to keep around for some reason because they're our old ways and we like to have them around. So we keep that little line tethered to them a little bit when we, even when we try to give them and let go. We, we don't let go. We keep that little line and we let back in. So we, truly letting go is truly letting God be that answer in that moment, in that time. I saw another hand over here somewhere. Pat, she's alive. Else has something to share. Any, any other praises or prayers? Fred! I learned an interesting fact this week. Are you aware that when the rapture happens, that the men are going to go to heaven for approximately 30 minutes before the women do? <laughs> <laughs> and to clarify that, the eighth chapter of Revelation first verse, it states, when he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. <laughs> oh,
Shirley Savannah. Okay, go ahead, Sherry. God does provide, and if you know or have a family that you know that's in need, please let us know. Um, one thing that we're, we are blessed with in this church, I don't know, you know, you know to see all around you, we got a few hunters around. Uh, I don't know if anyone got anything yet, but uh, I know I've, I've heard some, hey, I was really close stories so far, but uh, um, but that definitely if there's extra and we can help out in some way, we will definitely try to link people together and help them out as a community here at our church. Make sure you realize all those things. We are very happy that you are blessed by your children. Help you out with your You know, it's just them stepping into helping and maybe, you know, rely on God a little bit. I don't know. It's something to think about. Other prayers and praises. Lynn. So we'll definitely pray with you for you about that sore on your leg that will heal. Um, I saw another one here somewhere. Lori.
so much easier to give when we know it's God's money first, you know? It's amazing. And uh, I'm really uh, encouraged by that verse as well. As, as I've said many times, we, we are what we eat. If we feed ourselves trash, we're, we're a fool. If we seek knowledge, if we seek Him, if we seek God first, you know, we are wise. We are taking those steps of faith that we need to. So, very nice to know. Anyone else? Praise, praises or prayers? Right. Well, I, uh, I go under the knife here Tuesday for my eye, so um, on Tuesday my right eye is going to look differently, so I'll be able to see clearly out of it. It will be very nice. I'm having cataract surgery on, on my right eye this Tuesday, and then the following Tuesday, my left eye. And so please pray for me this Tuesday. If you're up at 6.30 in the morning, you're welcome to pray then. If, if not, do it Monday night, okay? It'll be great. I have those prayers uh, for my surgery a couple of years. Anyone else? All right, we'll take these before God. Feel free to kneel here at the altar and give uh, him, him praise. Uh, or bow your heads and hearts where you are. Lord God Almighty, we come to you. We thank you for... Um, Having, an having answered many prayers at our church, Lord, we stand for Christ. We stand for his good and faithfulness. Lord, we ask you to fill us today. We lift up these prayers in hopes that you would help these people on your ways and you would coordinate these things for their, their good. But most of all, Lord, that you would draw them to you. We pray for Louise Pluff as she has AFib and uh, is struggling with her heart there uh, going all over the place, God. We pray that she's able to stay in her home and you are able to regulate her heart and that um, is able to get back to a good rhythm. Lord, if that's a miraculous thing that you want to do in her, we ask you to heal her right now in the name of Jesus Christ. Lord, if you would work with the doctors or the medicines and things and you want to bring a miracle in her life that way, we pray for that as well. We just ask you to wrap your arms, arms around her and help her. We praise you and thank you for the women's retreat this last weekend. Um, the ladies that had gone were impacted um, by Christ. And as we um, are faithful to him, he is faithful to us. And so you can go as deep as you want with God, especially in those moments and those times as we draw close to him and recognize how he has us uh, as as our identity. We praise you that Pat's week has been uh, impactful in many ways, that she has survived and got through a car accident, but through that, through that um, spark has been able to uh, have more connections with more people, be able to have needs that she's needed uh, met in her life, and that she's been able to continue to refresh and renew her faith in you, seeing you work in her life. We praise you for that, Lord. We pray that prayer for others in this uh, church. Not that they have a car accident, God, but that they would have this impact, that they would have and, and have their life continue to draw close to you with blessing. We pray for anyone that is struggling with uh, food, food and have empty freezers coming up to the winter here, that their freezers would be able to be full and nutritious and, and that you would provide for them. That you would give them your daily bread, that you would give them uh, a the means and ability to get through. We praise that, that Sherry, um, as children, was able to see a need and fill a need in her life and her family's life. And we pray that for all of the people in our church and all the people that we know who might be struggling this holiday season. We pray for Lynn and her leg with her sore. Um, with diabetes is nothing to um, uh, be. Cavalier about, we ask that you heal her leg and heal her sore the way that you can heal her, Lord. Uh, we pray for her healing in the name of Jesus Christ, that all the things that she has done and, and the doctors and whatever strength, we ask that you, your strength and your healing would be upon her at this time. Amen. Help her, God. And we pray for Lori, um, and Tara, and Todd, continue to bond them together and help help you be the strong cord that helps that those relationships continue to go. Help Todd see God and the works, works and grace around him. Help Tara to give the joy 
and honor to God that he's due as he blesses her in her life. Thank you for, Lori, being able to stand firm and stand for Jesus in many times in her family. Lord, we come to you and pray for uh, my, my surgery coming up here this week, that you would be with the surgeon and the doctors, that you would heal my eyes, and uh, through this uh, cataract surgery, I would be able to see well, be able to navigate uh, reading glasses, or whatever I need to do to help myself uh, have a sight uh, near the end of the month here. And God, just help the healing process so that it's quick, painless, and, and go smoothly, God. We ask for all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. So this week, I, uh, I don't have a presentation to, to share with you on the screen there, um, so we're going to have to flip around our, our Bibles a little bit today, so make sure you have one available and access to one for yourself. I do think it's a, there's an advantage to you opening and flipping up a paper Bible. I know some people have apps or other things like that, but I just think it's, I don't know, it seems like when we read, read something, it just helps us rather than kind of engaging in a, in a presentation. Um, well, one of the things that's been going through my brain this, this uh, week, this month, I guess, uh, is the various churches and, and, and their denominations and how we are one in Christ, but sometimes we, we kind of have different ideas about some stuff, okay? Uh, they, they call it eschatology ex or theology, you know? You know, we may believe one thing and read this from a certain scripture, and, and another denomination or church may read something and believe something from another scripture. And so to have theological and ex ex oh, just forgive me that word, okay? <laughs> uh, uh, togetherness is an important thing in a church. Though I do think variety is the spice of life as well, and helping new ideas help us challenge our theological beliefs to be able to grow and stand firm in the beliefs we have are important too. So this is not an uncommon phenomenon, and actually in John... We're going to see here that the Jewish people had this kind of thought process too. And I'm going to get to this here in John chapter 1. In John chapter 1, um, they're talking to John the Baptist here. And uh, in verse uh, 19, so John chapter 1, uh, Gospel of John chapter 1, verse 19. Uh, John's talking to the Jewish leaders here. And I'm going to tell you some... some you know, eschatological or theological differences here, because this is what this is what the Jewish leaders are asking him. So, verse 19 says, Now, this is what John the Baptist's testimony when the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and the Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah. They asked him, And who are you? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. And then he finally said, who are you? Give us the answer. Take us back to those who sent you. What did they say to yourself? And John replied, in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of the one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. And now it seems kind of a, you know interesting passage to say, hey, there's theological differences here. But these, least, uh, these priests and Levites were asking him theological questions. They were saying, are you the Messiah? Do you claim to be the Messiah? Knowing John, knowing that they know, knowing that the Jewish people know full well Isaiah's prophecies towards Messiah. Now we talk about the prophecies towards Messiah all the time around Christmas time and kind of start to know a little bit, hey, how, how is Messiah going to come and, and what is he going to look like and all these kind of things. But the leaders of the time, the Jewish people of the time, had all these different ideas of what Messiah would be. And so they got this guy, John the Baptist, running around here doing <laughs> baptizing and talking about you know, the one that is to come. Are you the Messiah? No. And then they asked him, are you Elijah? Because they're trying to figure this stuff out. Now in Malachi, I don't know if you know, there's a prophecy from Malachi that Elijah will come before the day of judgment. And so, knowing this kind of stuff, what's going to happen is they're like, okay, well he's not the Messiah, so, so is, he, is he Elijah? 
Is he the guy that's going to come before and then the day of judgment is going to come? Now, we still preach that in church today, you know what I mean? Uh, Elijah will be one of the witnesses in Revelation that we say is going to be there in Israel um, at the, oh, it's the wall there. So, and so they're asking, are you Elijah? Because they're seeing him do these wonderful, miraculous things in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so they had, yeah, maybe he said, no, no, I'm not that either. And so this last one is the one that I didn't know as much about. And I'm going to share it with you today. It says, are you the prophet? And the prophet is actually a title. So much of Messiah, Elijah, and the prophet, rather than just being a, a random kind of prophet, because we have lots of prophets in the Bible. But the prophet is a biblical question. And he said no. So who is this the prophet thing, okay? So I'm going to go all the way back to Deuteronomy. Oh boy. Way, way back in your Bible. Deuteronomy chapter 32. Okay, so you have to go back in your Bible. It's uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay, you got that one? You have to know that song? Sing the... Okay, love that. Children in church work for me. All right, uh... <laughs> But Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy chapter 32. We're going to see Moses stand, uh, talking here and uh, talking about this prophet. Let's see, what? Is it 32? Yeah. It is 32, right? Oh, come on. Oh, no, it's six. It's back in the back of it. Here it is. 18. Deuteronomy 18. My, my, uh, my uh, paper clips let me run. Deuteronomy 18. A couple, couple chapters ago. Oh, chapter 18, verse 14 starts. It says, The nations will dis, uh, dispose, list, well, the nations you will um, dispossess, listen to the one who practiced sorcery and divination. But as far as you, the Lord your God, has not permitted you to do so. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you. From your fellow Israelites, you must listen to him, for this is what you ask of the Lord your God at Horeb. On the day that you assembled, when you said, Let us not hear the voice of the Lord our God and see a great fire anymore, or we will die, the Lord said to me, What they say is good. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among your fellow Israelites, and I will put my words in his mouth. And I will tell him everything I command. I myself will call to his account anyone who does not listen to my words, and that prophet will speak my name. But a prophet who presumes to speak my name in anything that I have not commanded, or a prophet who speaks my name of other gods, is to be put to death. You may say yourselves, how can we know such a message has not been spoken from the Lord, if what a prophet proclaims in the name of the Lord does not take place or come true, that is the message of the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptively not to do so, uh, not, so do not be alarmed. And so Moses is talking about this kind of stuff, and he's saying, hey, there's going to be another prophet like me that's going to come about and be a prophet similar to Moses, but his words are going to be God's words. It's going to be right directly, you know, right there in the heart. And this is how you will know. You will know because the things he will say will come to be, will come true. And after Moses' death here um, in Deuteronomy chapter 34, which is the last, right before Joshua here, right at the end. They mention him again and says, <clears throat> and Josh, uh, Deuteronomy 34 verse 9 says, Now Joshua son of Nun was... Filled with the spirit of wisdom because Moses laid his hands on him. Because Joshua took over from Moses after Moses passed away. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and to all the officials and to the whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or perform the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. And so there's these Jews around in John's time, 
they're saying, hey, are you the prophet? Because there was a um, theological belief still that that prophet hadn't come. Yes, there were prophets who had preached and, and shared God's word and get, get visions and dreams and Isaiah and Jeremiah and all these wonderful prophets. But this question comes up because still, in John, John's time, in John the Baptist's time, in Jesus' time, they asked him, are you the prophet? Because they had still not believed that that prophet had come. Now, if I were to give you a couple of uh, examples of this, so, so again, he speaks directly the words of God, is going to do miraculous signs and wonders comparable to the likes of Moses. What do you think that might be? Whew. So, if we get to the main text I want to look at today, is John chapter 6. And so we're going to flip over to John chapter 6. Now I've preached about this before, uh, John, uh, Jesus feeding the, the 5,000. It's John chapter 6. And what happens is, <clears throat> Jesus is helping move uh, almost a revival kind of, uh, kind of a thing going on, you know? Like 5,000 people are tracking Jesus down and thinking all sorts of various theological beliefs about Jesus. Some believe that he is the king. Some actually want to go up to him right now, put a crown on him and say, go take on Caesar. Go take on Rome. Some are saying, hey, maybe he's the, he's the prophet Elijah who's coming before the day of destruction is going to bring uh, the kingdom. Maybe he's the Messiah who's going to bring the kingdom of God to us, like a mighty general or like a, you know, all sorts of things. And some people are going to think, hey, maybe he's this prophet. Now this kind of revival of feeding the 5,000 is a wonderful thing. Uh, if, you, if you look at it here, they're in, in Galilee. Uh, they're on, they go over the Sea of Galilee and they go up to the, I think the northeast part of there. We'll be here in a sec. And that is the place where Philip, one of the disciples, is from. Now, something that you don't kind of get in the John context here, though, feeding of the 5,000 is all, in all four Gospels in different ways. If we kind of put that in the context a little bit, one of the things you don't realize is that for the last several months, the last couple of months, all the disciples had been sent out by Jesus to go preaching to the people and sharing the good news that Jesus has come. They've been healing, they've been giving, they've been doing all sorts of things. And what happens is, people are responding. People are seeing God move in the cities and in the, in the people, and things are going on. And so, in John chapter 6, it says this. After some time, Jesus crossed the far shore to the Sea of Galilee, that is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs that he had performed by healing the sick. And then Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near, and when Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, Where shall we go buy bread for these people to eat? He asked, the only, he asked this only to test him, for he had already had in mind what he was going to do. And Philip answered him, It would take more than half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one of these people to have a bite. And after his disciples, Andrew, Simon, Peter, uh, brothers, spoke up, Here's a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go among so many? And Jesus said, Have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in the place, and they sat down. About 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves and gave thanks, and distributed those who were seated there as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. And when they all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, Gather the pieces that are left over, and let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled small baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves, left over by those who had eaten. And after people saw the sign that Jesus had performed, they began to say, Surely, this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing what they intended to do, come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. 
So just, I, I, you know, as a pastor, I think about the disciples, okay? So these disciples have been out there ministering for a couple months to the people. And finally we get this, you know, Holy Spirit revival coming, and then Jesus goes says, hey, you have to do these guys or what? You know what I mean? That's what he does. He goes and says, you know, what's, what's going to happen here? And as the Bible says here, it was a test to Philip to say, you know what, Jesus? You know, Philip came up and said, you know, you know what, Jesus? You got this. Oh, he would have passed that test. But instead, Philip saw all these details and said, you know what? Wow, wow. Uh, in another version, it says 200 denarii to feed these people, Jesus. Uh, that's about eight months' wages, and uh, we don't have, uh, you know, two, two butterflies and a coin in our pocket here. You know what I mean? Like, we don't have that going on. And, right, as well as what's, what's going because the disciples are traveling around and basically trying to figure out how to get, get ends meet. I don't know if you, you know, they're, they're, they don't even have an extra tunic going on. And so, as he asked this question to Philip, Knowing the region, being from the region, he's kind of saying, what do we do for food here? And so he takes out basically five bread rolls, it's like little, uh, you know, dinner rolls, and two sardines is basically, basically what this loaves and fishes was. You know, we don't got like this big old uh, Subway sub foot long, 12 foot sub kind of thing going on here. We got five rolls and two sardines worth of food. And similar to the Last Supper that will come later, Jesus gives thanks and blesses that and does a miraculous thing. Now, again, if we give the disciples, we got 12 of them, right? Now there's 5,000 men. That doesn't include the women and children and other people that are around there. So, you know, we got extra people that he's eating with all this food going on here. But these 12 men are organizing, helping do the works of Jesus hands on feeding these people, providing for them, collecting in baskets, distributing these things, you know, making sure that, you know, I don't know, I, I, I doubt, I don't know, do you think the disciples change diapers? Who knows? Like, like there's something, and they're doing this, you got 5,000 people here, so all sorts of stuff's going on. Because Jesus was taking his time, talking, preaching, healing, and helping in, in this time, and finally says, hey, are we going to feed these guys? That he was taking these this times and probably in these different groups and going around and sharing something and then going around sharing something. You know, and, and, and I'm sure the disciples would say Jesus time, you know, because Jesus would just take his time with every single person, giving as much time as they could, going to the next, going to the next section here. And so, as the people saw this miracle of Jesus Christ, they don't say, oh, it's the Messiah. They say that it's this prophet. Well, why is this? Well, miraculous signs and wonders is definitely part of the reason why they see that. They see they're doing it. But in the rest of chapter 6, after the walk on water, which, you know, I, that's what I would focus on. But Jesus goes and talks about, in, in uh, verse 25, when his disciples come to him later. Verse 25, it says, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? And he says, very truly, I tell you, you're looking for me, not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you... You are the loaves, because you are the loaves, and you had your fill. Do you not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give for you? For on your Father has placed the seal of approval. And so then they asked him this question. You know, Jesus you know, answers questions with questions. Very nice. It says, then he asked, what, will miss do to what must we do to the work God requires. And Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. And so they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see and believe you? Oh boy. I don't know. It, doesn't, it said they asked him, so it must be all of the disciples were stumped there. I don't know. I, I wouldn't want to be the one that said, oh, Well, show me and then I'll believe it, God. You know, that's not a great... Uh, what will you do? Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And so, as we look at one of that signs there, that that was Moses, right? Because because I bet you, as they said that he was the prophet, they're thinking that he is like Moses in that he fed multitudes of people with this bread, just similarly to the way the manna had come down from heaven 
to provide for the people in that time. But as, as I've said before, and I've, I've tried to help us understand, is that sometimes those Old Testament physical helps are illustrations of a more spiritual nature. And John goes into this here in verse 32. Because Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. And of course they're still thinking in the physical realm here. He says, Sir, give us this bread. This is the best bread. Yeah, I want bread that gives life to the world, not these rolls that we just had. Then Jesus is declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. But as I told you, you have seen me, and still you do not believe. All, of those, all those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but to do the will of him who sent me. And this will be him who sent me, that I shall lose none at all those who he has given me, but raise them up at the last day. For my Father, Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son, believes in Him, shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Hallelujah. And so, in this illustration of giving the 5,000 bread, these different theological beliefs, just similar to our, our modern day church, you know, different people will read things into things differently and take more out of things or less out of things based on their measure of faith. I am sure there are people that are sitting there in that 5,000 that got fed and said, wow, what a wonderful meal. And I'm sure there are people sitting there in that 5,000 that said, wow, what a wonderful God. And we as people in our modern day need to recognize those times that God is feeding us. Give Him that glory. Help Him see what He sees. Help Him, as the disciples are not seeing clearly in, those, in this way, in those, these kind of ways, here and, and asking these interesting questions to Jesus, where He sees this deeper spiritual meaning to say, yeah, it was a miracle that I, that I gave 5,000, but... Truly the miracle is the bread of life that I give as those believe in me. And this is how Jesus equips his people. This is how Jesus helps, uh, as, as a leader, helps see his disciples. He gives them work to do to help organize the people, get the 5,000 fed, collect the rest of the baskets, minister beforehand and all these things, these, these things. But they, they culminate into something more. They culminate into the truth of eternity, they culminate into the truth that Jesus is the bread of life and to help plug those people in. As I talked to some of the, the social workers and nurses, as we gave out some monies to them here for, to our elementary schools a few months ago, they said one of the biggest needs in our community is socioeconomic. That people are lacking hygiene supplies. That people lack food. That people lack basic necessity stuff. They see it every day in the schools. They see it uh, with the families and the, and the population around us. Uh, especially, uh, you know, the, the one I talked to the most was the Hastings Mallory uh, social worker. I think her name is Keenville. She's she, very nice, very nice girl. And she said, you know, the thing that this money will go towards is helping us make sure that we can share love through basic needs. Because as we give a coat, a thing of shoes, a food, a little bit of care and a little bit of love, people get fed for that day. But it takes that Christian, that witness, to help say, no, you were fed for the day because of the glory and the love and the goodness of God. And that's how you can have the true bread and the true water that you will never thirst again. And the disciples got that message. I think it sunk into them a little bit. You know, some of them are hard-headed. I'm, I'm sure, sure no one in here is hard-headed. You know, we just, we just got to get in our brains that sometimes even when we're in economic and, and struggles, God might use those circumstances. 
He might use a water break. He might use a car accident. He might use a flubbed up note or a, you know, misspelled word or who knows for his glory and for his good so that we can see God's in the, in the details, that we can see God in the works of these different things. Because his desire is to continue to redeem and lead his people to, to God. And, you know, because I didn't cover this, you know, but basically, you know, because they were going to, like, take him by force and go get him king, you're just like, you know what, I'm, I'm going to go up and yeah, it's okay, I'm going to go away for a little bit. That's okay, you guys think of that. With all these various theological beliefs that they had, he's Messiah, put him up there. You know, he's the prophet, he's exactly like Moses, he fed us, he did all these things. But our New Testament uh, ability, now that we know his mission, and know his message. We know that he was Messiah and the prophet. We know that he fulfilled these things, that he was able to do those. And, you know, we still, you know, that people will allude that John the Baptist might have been an Elijah that came. But we also know that in the day of judgment that Elijah will come as well. And Jesus' purpose for his coming here in our scripture is the same purpose that he's going to be coming again is to bring about his kingdom. To bring about his kingdom here on earth. And one of the wonderful advantages of the scripture is in the Bible it helps us see um, how and what kind of things we have to get our brain right on in his kingdom. And as a Christian, we got a heads up on that. Start thinking of those deeper spiritual needs that you may have or the people around you may have. And it may be filling one simply by a physical need that they have or, a, or even just a prayer or a support. Um, you know, like, I, like I've said a couple of times, I want, I want people who, who come next week to have old friends re re reunited with us, to have new people who have never stepped foot in this church. But I want them to have the message that God changes lives. I want them to have the message that God, Jesus Christ, is the bread of life. And if they can catch that a little bit, then I know that all of that effort that people have worked for and done will be, will be worth it in his kingdom. Because if one person comes to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, thousands of angels rejoice in heaven. And that's what we're here for. We're here for that life change. And we're here for the life change of these things too. I know... They're, I'll probably find a different place for these next year, but, you know, they're up here because we're going to be praying over these next week because the, each one of these boxes represents a life changed. And as Samaritan Persis here, sometimes a family changed as they follow through and disciple those kids. And so be in prayer. And not just in prayer, but be in action for the people that you know need that life change and have them be here this upcoming week. Help us feed them. In lots of ways. Let's end with our last song here. What do we got here? Resting place.
Lord, we thank you for this church and your people here. Lord, that we have a sanctuary where we can meet, where you dwell, where we can come together as Christians in love. Continue to build us. Let your kingdom, let your kingdom come and your will be done in us and here in this place. Bless our congregation as they go out this week. Help continue to grow their faith. Help them to see God in the midst of these things, both in the physical needs of the people around them and both in the spiritual needs of the people around them. And Lord, show up in a powerful way to fill those needs. And help us to be in the hands of feet in God in those situations for your people. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. 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 Praise God. Thank you all for coming. We'll see everyone here next week. Oh, it's going to be great. Don't anyone leave unless I get your picture. Oh, no. Oh, no. Uh-uh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh.